Everybody listen to We Are Not Wizards. Because we are the best. And we're not wizards. No matter what anybody says. Goodbye. <laughs>
I I, I played, uh, you know, your typical kid board games <laughs> like Monopoly and whatever. <laughs> uh, and in uh, high school, we had a social studies club. And on social right. studies club, on Thursdays, we would play stuff like Stratego, Fortress America, uh, Axis mm-hmm. and, and Allies. Um, so mm-hmm. I, I did play those, although uh, we never finished anything because, you know, <laughs> three hours was never enough to play a, a, a game no. of Axis and Allies. Um, yeah. Uh, and of course, we didn't, you know, we were just like, okay, let's pack up. And we never finished. <laughs> we got to the middle of the war and that was it. Yeah, exactly. Uh, so, uh, when, will, when will Henry return from the war? <laughs> right. Um, <laughs> but no, uh, to, to, you know, talk about, and of course, um, I've heard of other games, you know, things like mm-hmm. what Cranium, um, you know, like yeah. my brother would talk about playing Cranium, uh, um, Talisman. Um, <laughs> yeah. But uh, I had never played any of those. And Honestly, my cousin was just trying to bring out something that we could do together. And uh, so it wasn't yeah. like he was sort of trying to get us to play games. He was just, hey, you want to try this? And he was like, uh, mm. he pulled it out and we tried it. And really, that was it. What did you think of Pandemic at the time? Because, I mean, in a similar, I guess in a similar kind of vein, one of the first games I ever owned was Pandemic. And I think one of the first games I actually ever played with my my kids at the time was pandemic. Um, I mean, what was your what were your first initial impressions after you? I mean, first of all, did you win? I mean, did you manage to cure the diseases, or did you did you lose? Oh, we lost that first kind of game. We yeah. we, we absolutely lost. Um, I mean, it was, it was the first game for most of the people playing. Honestly, so you know, we didn't really know what was going on. Mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. My cousin, of course, knew his game, but um, yeah. Uh, but he wasn't. He's not the alpha player type, you know. So he wasn't like you should do this and do this. Yeah. So we were just yeah. like, okay, well, there you go, eight, uh, <laughs> eight, uh, whatever outbreaks or whatever they call them, uh, and, and yeah, it's over. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, it took us about an hour um, to to lose. <laughs> so so there was that. Um, but we all enjoyed yeah. it. I mean, uh, we enjoyed sort of like, you know, uh, arguing about what to do and and figuring it out and. Sort of towards the middle, we sort of had an idea of of mm-hmm. how we could win, but we knew we knew it was over for us by then. But we played it out anyway, and uh, then <laughs> yeah, people had to leave, so we couldn't play it again. <laughs> but yeah, I think the interesting thing about um, pandemic at the time, especially when we we played it for the first time, was there wasn't. It was the first game, I guess, I played where there wasn't a there was a win condition. But it wasn't a case that you were, there was definitely going to be somebody that was the winner, and I think that was definitely I think that was definitely something that my kids at the time were extremely surprised about actually even explaining the rules because their first thing was well, how do you win? And it's like well you win by curing all the diseases, and it's like is that and 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 who how do you decide the winner? It's like no, if you know we all win if um, if we manage to survive this. And I was like, you're using F a lot, Dad. And I was like, yeah, yeah, but I'm using F an awful lot to describe this game. Because I had heard, I'd heard how difficult it was. And obviously we played the first, I think we played the first two, three games. And we um, we got annihilated to the point where the kids were like, mm, I don't know what we should do. So we, we took away, I think, the random element of deciding who you were, your starting player was. And I think we just, you know, we, we picked kind of like the same three or four people Every time we kind of played, and we we did kind of manage to kind of beat it, but um, it was kind of interesting to, you know, when we lost, <laughs> for the kids to say, "Well, what happens now?" Then it's like, "No, that's it. The game's you're finished. You're, you know, everybody in the planet's dead. It's, that's it over. You don't continue." And they're like, "Oh, can we play again?" Kind of thing, which was kind of, which was kind of cool. Um, where did you move from pandemic then? Where did, what, what, where did you go in after that? Well, what happened after pandemic was I started, I, I, I jumped in to find out, hey, what is this, you know, board game thing about? And uh, so yeah. YouTube, you know, was a, obviously, there's tons of stuff on YouTube. So um, the next thing I did was I started watching uh, Will Wheaton's Tabletop. 
Um, oh yeah, yeah. Because I, well, honestly, what it is, I went to, uh, I, I went and I searched for board games, and uh, um, on Google, and Google pointed out YouTube, and the first uh, was one of was one of the episodes. I don't, I, I don't even remember which one it was. Um, and so I, I watched that, and I watched the people having fun, um, uh-huh. which I, which I, I think that series, the tabletop, which is uh, sadly gone, but. Um, I found that that series they they did that very well, you know, like having fun with board games, um, as opposed to like trying to tell you how to play or show you the mechanics or whatever. Um, so I I watched a bunch of those, and uh, then I picked a couple that I wanted to try out from from okay. that series. Okay. And so the next two for me were Takedo and Takenoko. Uh, because this They're whole drastically, drastically different type of game. Oh yeah. Um, but uh, you know, like because I guess the the theme, the whole uh, you know, the Eastern theme, uh, sort of yeah. sort of caught my eye because you know I'm I'm a, a Chinese, so um, right, okay. You know, I, I I don't know that it's necessarily that, but it just caught my eye, and uh, so that's 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 where, and then from then it was you know more. This and then finding about finding out about the dice tower, mm-hmm. um, and it, it just sort of like and then I just dove in. That was it. Was it easy? I mean, were you then in the situation where you were having to persuade um, <clears throat> your friends and your acquaintances to kind of jump on the game train as well? Because the best thing about board games is it's really easy to buy lots of them. The worst thing about board games. Is it can be really quite difficult to nail people to the table, and sometimes physically, um, to get them to kind of commit to actually playing a game. So did that did that encourage you to kind of find kind of groups to play in and kind of broaden your your kind of circle, or was did you did you kind of um, <clears throat> basically drafting your cousin again to kind of start playing games with you on a regular basis? Um. Well. I it, it it was something something of that um hmm. the the I I would I played mostly with my family honestly um uh, and uh my extended family cousins and and so on and uh I I play when uh whenever we have an occasion to come together uh but honestly that's not weekly um you know hmm. um yeah so but I I sort of become the hey he's going to bring board games kind of person <laughs> in the family <laughs> and uh and that's what i've been doing <laughs> you ever been tempted not to bring board games and just watch the, the kind of the faces of disappointment it's like why have i got to always put out here uh you know, who not, am not, I? Am not I really like... maybe, maybe i'm not that <laughs> not far <yet>. into <laughs> into the experience <laughs> i mean honestly it's only been three years right uh yeah i suppose so that's that but that's a long time in board gaming I mean, there's been, you know, there's been sufficient changes in the kind of the the market. So, do you get um, do you get regular games? Otherwise, do you are you a member of kind of like local groups and things like that that you go to, or do you rely on kind of like immediate friends and family to play? Uh, well, I I had uh, drawn up enough courage to go to a a local store where where they had uh, you know regular meetings on Sundays. And then, mm-hmm. uh, like a week or two after I went for the first time, the store moved to a place where <laughs> it's now impossible to get to in like an hour and a half. Uh, so, oh, no. yeah, it's 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 family and and occasional friends kind of thing now. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, you've obviously you kind of you picked up by going through YouTube. You picked up all the games that people were aware of i mean did did you do you have quite a substantial collection at the moment then are you are you kind of borderline kind of collector slash kind of player i'm i'm definitely person? more of a collector at this point um, right okay i i actually enjoy reading the rule books and stuff although i never retain anything um okay. but you know i i like i like learning about about how they play and and stuff like that so at this point my collection is more um, of of it's you know the collector type stuff mm-hmm. than uh, the play type stuff. 
Do you solo play at all? I do. Um, so because it because at this point it's friends and family, uh, the multiplayer mm-hmm. games that I end up playing end up being simpler because yeah. uh, you know it's just because uh, I I don't have a group meeting every week and we can't sort of learn and and dig into a game you know like you know uh, like something like Root for example uh, I would not be able yes. to bring to a table at all because there's no way you can do that unless you're willing to like put in a multi multi week uh, let's let's learn these factions kind of thing um, so I I the only way I can sort of quench that thirst. Because I I do like the uh, somewhat more complicated stuff, um, is to mm-hmm. solo play. Um, so I, I I go after so the the games that I have that are soloable tend to be more complicated than the games yeah. that uh, you know that I have for playing with other people. Yeah, I mean um, I had um, Bless Davidson on just like a couple of weeks back talking about kind of how in general the kind of the whole solo kind of game offering seems to have improved and improved and improved um are there any games that you're kind of getting to the table on a regular basis in a solo kind of vein that you're really kind of getting your teeth into well i've been playing uh, a bunch of argonauts um from a greek publisher i think um okay and uh nemo's war those two are sort of my solo in in the front mm-hmm. of my solo space right now. Although I'm looking forward to Seventh Continent, uh, which I intend to play s- oh, primarily yeah. solo, and that's supposed to be arriving yeah. in maybe a week or something. Yeah, they're just um, they're just going through their like their fulfillment kind of piece at the moment. Um, and I've had a lot of people kind of well, I've read about a lot of people kind of getting them opening up the box and just going. There's so much content here. I don't even know. Kind of where to start. It is. Um, it looks like a kind of game you can just lose yourself in for like weeks. It's kind of like your kind of. It looks like your kind of your Red Dead Redemption. Um, you know, kind of, I guess, video game type blockbuster game. You can just easily put kind of a hundred hours into it and and not even worry. You're not even kind of like scratching, <laughs> scratching the surface with. It. Um, are there other? I mean, are there other? Um, solo games you're wanting to get your hands on as well then and other games you'd like to to get a shot of well i i'm always keeping my eye out and uh mm-hmm. things like your show are <laughs> where i get some leads um so i i do have a couple obviously that have come up on uh kickstarter that i've that i've backed like uh the recent one is that maki from the same people who did um that shakespeare one uh black sonata i think it is. yeah black sonata right um I have I yeah, have Black yeah, Sonata. Yeah. I've I've played that. Uh it's an interesting that one's an interesting play too. Although right now, like I said, my head is in those other those other two games. Yeah, yeah. Do you I mean when you're playing solo play, do you are you tempted to kind of sit back and really concentrate and envelop yourself in a game? Cuz I know that, you know, what I've noticed in my time kind of playing more and more games with more and more people is there's generally there's a bit more of a rush for people to get a game to the table to kind of strike it off the list and say it's been played whereas in the solo kind of game are you are you kind of like well you know i've got plenty of time i can actually if i want to i can sit down kind of two three nights in a row and just you know play this put you know three four hours into this every kind of night if you want to so you're able to kind of, I guess, enjoy it a little bit more. Uh, yes, I, I I do find that. Although, I don't really have the space to leave a game out overnight. Mm. Um, but I am mm. willing to sit there for hours, um, to sort of like you know think out my turns. You know, like the the whole AP thing. But it doesn't matter if you're playing solo. Um, so does yeah. Does Jink does AP get worse if it's solo play? Because I can imagine. I can imagine you kind of you don't end up planning kind of like one move ahead. It almost becomes like a chess game or a puzzle. You try to fix out and say, right, well, if I get if I get the resources from here on this round, I can then use them in that round. And depending on how the cards kind of come up and you know how the the 
the automata or whatever kind of plays its game, I can do this, 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 this and this. So do you end up kind of sitting there just sometimes just staring at the board, looking at it and just going, hmm, kind of thing? Well, let's put it this way. I'm much more willing to do that in a solo game than, <laughs> than one in which there's other people <laughs> staring at me, waiting for me to complete my move. I know. You can just imagine that. I, I don't know. I know that um, Colin, the, the play with games he gets, he kind of gets AP. He actually has to sit there and apologize and say, sorry guys, the, the AP is kind of is killing me here. I can't, you know, I can't even consider the type of move that I'm going to be making, um, which is always tremendously good fun. Um, however, I can see that on a kind of a solo game, you can just say, well, I'm going to stand up you know, refill my glass, get myself some grease-free snacks, and then sit back at the table and where we can, kind of where we can kind of kind of go. Um, with that in mind, though, are you more akin to look at kind of like more solo games now than multiplayer games, being aware you're more likely to get that to the table? Not really. Um, it you know because. There's so many other things that you can do solo uh, besides playing board games. So, um, you know, it, I have a, a couple of them, uh, but I wouldn't, mm-hmm. I wouldn't say, let's say half my collection is solo games or even soloable games um, mm-hmm. because the, the main reason I want to, br- you know, bring a board game to the, to the table is to play with other people. Um, but, you know, there there's always space for both. Um, so I, I don't necessarily go for solo games. Um, mm-hmm. But one thing that I don't do is I don't go for like three-player minimum games because that yeah. that is really difficult uh, in, in, in my situation. I find it interesting. I was thinking about um, that quite recently in terms of um, I know a lot of games that claim are two to five but they're clearly three player is the most optimum way to play the game because two player just it doesn't work. There's not that extra third person kind of putting the spanner in the works. Um I was playing um <coughs> Donning the Purple recently, um by Tompic Games, and that it was like this is a three player game. You can play it two player. But the best way to play it is three player, and they they were they were right. <laughs> you know, I had mm-hmm. we had an, an amazing amount of fun um, playing Donning the Purple. Um, it was really you know it really really was one of those games that just kind of really clicked with me, and I had a I had a blast. And there wasn't kind of like um, a clear runaway winner at the end. It was still very very close, right up to the kind of the very very end of the game, which was pretty good. But I kind of it got me thinking. Are there a lot of games which claim to be two to five player, but ideally they've always been designed to have you know f- three, four, or five. You're always going to have a kind of like a better, a kind of a better kind of ex, kind of a better kind of experience. Well, it, it in there my in my experience, um, it it's really mixed because I I have you know games that claim two to four, and it's obviously mm-hmm. two players. Uh, this is yeah. a two-player game where where three and four are added on, and uh, yeah. and and of course there are games which claim uh, two to five, two to six, and it's really for like four, five, six, or three, you know, yeah. or, or best at three or whatever. So it's really difficult to mm-hmm. to, to know. Um, you have to sort of depend on things like that BGG thing, which I I find that quite useful, where they have that people vote for the best at according to the community kind of thing. Um, that's yeah. that's rather helpful. Uh, but sometimes, you know, like sometimes, you know, like I'm very shallow, and the theme wins wins me over. It doesn't really matter. <laughs> so, I, you know, I was like that. I'll be honest with you. I was like that with Root. You know, when I saw the box, the I mean, not say the theme, but just like the art for Root, I was just like, mm, I have to have this. <laughs> Yeah, I would. I didn't care. Yeah, we, I didn't care what the game was about. <laughs> yeah, with with root, if, every time I see it, it's like I want this game, but then I I like think about it for a, a few minutes and I'm like I'll never bring this to the table. 
you know, although the the recent campaign they had the solvable rules, so that was a yes. real temptation. <laughs> it's um, it's really funny because it's it's one of the few games where I think um, it's repeatedly visited the table. It's actually probably one of my most played games, to be honest. And it's not just most played by me. I will usually, I will bring it to the club, and people will approach me at the games club and say, "You brought him? Um, you haven't brought Root with you by any chance?" Because they are hoping that I've brought my copy so that they can get a game. So the last couple of times I've been playing, like, um, like uh, when I was playing Dawning the Purple, when I was playing recently, kind of Fire in the Library. Um, when I was playing those, there was another table that were they were going, they were playing like a four-player game of Root, <laughs> which was like a My Root, so it was still getting game, plenty of plays. But as my point was that it's one of these games that it comes back to the table again and people go, look, um, I was looking through the rule book the other night and it appears that we've played this particular mechanic completely wrong. Um, mm. <laughs> that kind of happened. Mm-hmm. One kind of two or three times, but it's definitely, it's definitely worthwhile playing it. Um, it actually kind of leads you into the coin kind of games, those kind of games, because it is at it its heart, it's kind of, it is basically a war game. And um, a lot of the coin games and stuff like that, they run some really good um, solo player stuff. Um, and, you know, the, the, way they, the, the way they run their kind of their automatic single player stuff is, is really kind of kind of impressive um how did you get how did you start the jump into kickstarter then uh well what made you what made what made you go kind of go down that route honestly it was takaido which was like the second game that (laughs) i went for um so when i when i went for takaido uh i i I, Mm -hmm. I purchased a copy and then i found out that hey they had a kickstarter which was long gone you know long past and i'm like what the heck is this and then, so uh, in in searching for Tokaido, uh, one of the search results was the Kickstarter page with that um, the super deluxe, whatever the heck they had with the painted figures. And I'm like, I wish yeah, I had that. Yeah. Um, and then at that point, I'm like, okay, well, I I better check this Kickstarter thing. And uh, well, that's really what started it. Is it different, kind of like having kind of like um, having a game kind of straight away? And then the Kickstarter, I mean, are you more likely to be a Kickstarter backer than just going ahead and purchasing it? Or do you have a fine, a final balance? Or have you gone through the situation where you kind of like you just backed everything kind of left, right and centre for a while and then had a flood of games kind of coming in? Um, I think I'm a little bit past that, although I did do that. You know, just say let's back mm. anything that looks, you know, oddly interesting. Uh, so yeah. I, I did that. I think I'm past that and I'm a little bit more picky um Mm -hmm. now but i am not in uh uh in the stage where it's one in one out which is uh Mm. i i i'm sure i'll get there um just based on my own yeah my my own collection habits just just in the past i've collected a number of things uh, from like video games and dvds Mm -hmm. whatever and it's like this Mm -hmm. this rush in the beginning to you know grab what you can um at least for me right uh grab what you can and then it and then tapers off and then at some point, I'm sure I'll get to the to the point where it's just like, yeah, I've got games that I like, and I'm you know one or two might catch my eye, and I might add them, but then something else has got to go. But I'm not there yet. Have you seen changes in Kickstarter since you started using it? I mean, as somebody who is at the beginning was kind of making decisions on backing kind of games, have you seen a change in how? projects are presenting themselves on kind of kickstarter over the last couple of years not really uh because at at the point where i jumped in to kickstarter um mm-hmm. the, you, you know you the pages were already advertisements i mean you know full blown yeah. uh you know and that was the expectation for most of the bigger ones of course you have the smaller ones that they just show what they can you know that we haven't paid the artist yet kind of thing um yeah or this is just you know an imaginary project at this point, and we're still figuring it out, kind of thing. Um, so you still have some of those, but by the time I jumped in, there were already these glossy pages, um, 
of, of course, in researching a particular project, you know, you might look at the older, and I've seen what the pages used to look like, and that was quite different. Where you know, it's a much well, it was a much simpler time, um, but yeah, when, where I jumped in, the pages were already glossy. Well, what 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 I have seen is is the the change in backer attitude. Um, All right. Okay. Uh, you know, I've I've seen this like souring. It looks. It seems like souring of 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 backers who are, uh, you know, or, or I I I don't want to go as far as saying trollish. Although I have seen real real trollish, uh, um, but I have seen more and more people, um, sort of like it's my way or I'm not going to back this. Well, you already backed it. Otherwise, you're not commenting. Um, so, you know, I've I've seen more and more of that, uh, unfortunately. And what I fear is like what's become of online video games right uh in in the in the past uh just let me give you an example um w- one of the biggest online video games that i played uh back in the playstation 3 era um uh was uh burnout paradise and oh, yeah. uh, and uh you know like we would jump online with a bunch of random people because that's how the game was designed and they were friendly Everybody just wanted to like play around and you know, um, and and, and accomplish that. They had you know that game had those uh, uh, cooperative goal things, which were you know you just check check box. You don't get anything for it, but it's a check box. People were just having fun doing that kind of stuff, and it was just fun to spend an evening, a couple hours or whatever, uh, just fooling around and, and playing, you know. And then you got the then the game became like cheaper, right? Because time went by. And you have a bunch of people who had probably got the game for like a buck, two bucks, whatever. And, um, you know, you had these people being very nasty and, and, and just screaming at everybody. And it's like, it's no fun to play when you have these people yelling on the thing or, or people slamming your car just because they can do it, you know. Um, so that's the kind of thing that I'm afraid is going to happen. I think um, what we're getting to is we're starting to get into the this horrific sense of entitlement that is prevalent in video games, which uh, which is there, and it's an expectation that I am, you know, I am the consumer here, therefore I am kind of funding you, therefore I can basically try and call the shots. And I don't think that, was kind of happening in Kickstarter, especially in the board game space, um, until until board games tabletop itself became more and more popular. And I think that when you become more and more mainstream as a hobby, I think you encourage people which basically have a crap attitude. And that's when you start to get the people who are basically, um, you know, as you said, kind of giving, kind of having just, you know, no, just kind of coming in and just saying, I expect this, I expect that, uh, and not being constructive. Whereas the Kickstarter that I was aware of, and I've been kind of involved in Kickstarter for too many years now, there was almost a sense of community that people not only wanted to, they not only wanted the person to succeed, but they wanted to almost support that person succeeding and also a lot of people were kind of giving support out with what they needed to do as a backer as in they were not only willing to give money but they were also going to be the people that said look I know a guy who can translate the rule book into French for you I know somebody who you know who can help you with logistics I know x y and z on social media kind of thing and that you know and 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 yeah I think is it expands, we kind of get these people who are, you know, for want of a better word, entitled assholes, <laughs> you know. Okay, you, you, you said that, not of, me. Kind of unfortunate. I, you know, I, you know, I don't care what you're going to do. <laughs> you know, what are they going to do? You know, uh, you know, go and, go and run along and scream about, you know, scream at the clouds of stuff that you're not, you're not getting for whatever reason. You know, that's fine. You do that. Um, from somebody who is a regular backer, is there stuff, is there 
certain things that will just put you off a project straight away that are kind of no-nos because um, there seems to be Kickstarter seems to be there seems to be a lot of pre-order stuff going on as in a case of yeah this is definitely getting made but you're essentially helping us kind of take away the risk I mean is there projects that you just will not back at all well I you know you just not even look at yeah I, I don't really mind that whole uh, you know as long as as long as they're, you know, up front and saying, hey, you know, this is a pre-order or, you know, in, in some cases, you know, this company <laughs> is, is yeah. pretty much doing that. I don't mind that. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's just another way of, of, of them doing and exposing uh, their product line to people, you know, more people. And Kickstarter has got lots of people. That's probably why you, you yeah. see board games there more than like Indiegogo or something like that. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, I don't have a problem with that as long as they're up front and not trying to fool you into saying, hey, you know, um, you know, this is this is not. We you know we're, we're trying to do this. Um, for me, the thing that would turn me off to a project is things like uh, I I'm not interested in this theme. Um, you right, know, okay. uh, the, the co- content wise, I, I don't or I find this uh, mechanism, you know, not not to my liking. So I'm more I'm more there than uh, mm-hmm. than this company does this or does that. Um, but of course, uh, on the on on the other hand, if if it's like a two hundred euro project, I'm like, well, maybe I need to think about that <laughs> kind of thing. Um, so, as I mean, Kickstarter prices seems to be kind of continuing to rise. I mean, have you got a happy medium where you'll just you'll back at that price and not think about it? I mean, have you got to say, well, if it's above ninety dollars, I need to think about it. If it's you know, if it's less than 50, then it's just an automatic. If the theme speaks to me and the type of the game speaks to me, I'm just going to go ahead and back that. Well, my attitude out of um, but budgetary necessity is I don't auto-back anything. No, nothing is an right. auto-back. Um, I always uh, will spend some time reviewing the project, and sometimes that's reviewing the project before. It, it appears like, you know, if you get on some of these lists, they tell you, hey, my project's upcoming. Uh, here's a preview page, so you know I can do that mm-hmm. before. Um, but yeah, I I I don't auto back anything, um, and I do try to keep to a budget. Um, mm-hmm. uh, although sometimes I I will like borrow from the next month <laughs> <laughs> kind of thing. <laughs> but but yes, uh, there's that. You currently you're currently borrowing from February 2022. At the moment, <laughs> I don't. I don't go that far. Um, but, but yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, one of one of the questions that comes up. I mean, normally, normally when I see, are you a member of any kind of like Kickstarter, Facebook groups, and things like that? I mean, how do you dis- How do you find out about Kickstarter? I mean, and do you feel, do you feel as a backer that the um Kickstarter project creators are trying to find out from you what you want to see to back the game. Do you get that kind of sense of involvement? Okay, so on the Facebook thing, I don't really, mm-hmm. I don't really do Facebook at all. I don't even have an account. Um, but that's not because of this, uh, you know, follow, not following mm-hmm. or not following Kickstarter. I just, I just don't want to deal with the kind of thing you get on Facebook. Um, yeah. Okay. So, so. You know, there's not. I don't do Facebook, um, but I do like to get on um, mailing lists of, of companies. That uh, a lot of the time, when you do the Kickstarter thing, they're like, "Hey, do you want to get on our mailing list?" And I'm I'm always like, "Sure, I'll get on your mailing list." Um, <laughs> uh, but honestly, how do I find out about something new on Kickstarter? Yeah. Well, there's the, you know, games tabletop games newest uh, search yeah. feature. <laughs> That's the easiest way to, to find out <laughs> the newest stuff. So you're not actively being, you wouldn't consider yourself being kind of actively marketed to. You're not a person that you're kind of, you're getting like hundreds and hundreds of emails every kind of month to say, you know, you liked this previous game, here's our new project. Do you kind of find out kind of that way or are you just generally saying, right, Let's go to Kickstarter. Let's go to tabletop projects, and let's click the newest and see what see what kind of ponies up. Well, I basically well, like like I said, I sign up for pretty much every list, 
So I I do get right. uh, a lot of that um, uh-huh. uh, direct stuff, but the direct stuff is not always Kickstarter. You know, like mm-hmm. like AEG, you know, sends me monthly newsletters on, hey, we're putting this out. Okay, great. You know, mm-hmm. am I interested? Maybe. Um, <laughs> you know, so so yeah, I I'm, I am definitely getting those, and I have no no problem reading those things. I I don't get so many that it feels like spam, at least not yet. Um, so. Yeah, I, I I definitely do get do get that. I don't do the whole, uh, you know, um, you know how they do on Facebook polling. Hey, what would you yeah. like to see? Well, obviously, I'm mm-hmm. I don't have Facebook, so I don't do any of that stuff. But even yeah. even when companies put out a, a poll, which they can do with like a Survey Monkey or whatever, um, yeah, I'm not particularly inclined to like fill in the poll. Um, okay, so. There's that. What about um, what about I mean, what about the videos? Because one of the things that you know, the reason I'm asking you these questions is because I am a member of a lot of these Kickstarter groups. You know, there's the UK Kickstarter one. There's the, you know, there's a crowdfunding Facebook. There's a lot of kind of like help groups out there, and all I see is I see creators talking to creators. Do you know what I mean? Right. I kind of see it's almost like you've kind of got, you know, a whole group of restaurant chains kind of sitting around the table together and saying, what what do you think the next big thing is going to be in terms of food? And the customers are standing outside the window looking in on the board meeting and just saying, well, why isn't anybody kind of asking us what's kind of attractive to the campaign? Which is so you are basically the voice of everybody who's <laughs> backed on Kickstarter, Henry. It's not a it's not a lot of pressure, but it is. But in terms of like a campaign layout, do you want do you want big, huge, flashy presentations? I mean, do you bother even looking? at the video that's at the top of the campaign? I mean, is that something you even spend time on? Or do you just like, okay, I'm just going to scroll down and actually read read the text that's there? I usually do watch the... Well, first of all, if the game has not totally turned me off, which there are some things that do, like um, World War One, World War Two, I'm really not into that um, theme at all. Mm-hmm. So yeah. the game might be great. Yeah. You know, I'm not into that theme. So... Um, right. As long as it, you know, it's not one of those, um, I will read the text first, but then I will watch that video at the top of the page and all the other individual videos. Um, but of course, you have those weeks sometimes where 300 game, oh, that's an exaggeration, but you know, 300 things will come out on Tuesday. Uh, you're not far off. And, 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 and <laughs> you're, just, you're not far off at the moment. There's no yeah. way to keep up with that. Um, so yeah. I will... Uh, yeah, unfortunately, what happens is on Tuesday, um, I I will, uh, you know, do that heart thing, save this, uh, save this mm-hmm. page, um, yeah. and uh, then everything that has an early bird that even has a little bit of, hey, this might interest me, I might jump into that to try to save a little mm-hmm. money or something, and then um, gi- and then over the time of the campaign, give myself time to review it and. Get out of the, get out of the early bird I don't want or un unbookmark, uh, whatever. So, but yes, I I, I do uh, I I will read the campaign first, and then I will right. go back and review the videos, starting with the one at the top of the page. Okay, and do you expect them to give you as much information as possible? Then, I mean, as a gameplay, I mean, one of the things is I guess the other thing that in talking of videos. Do you look at preview videos or are they just marketing kind of bump? You know, if you click down and you see, say that, um, <clears throat> if you say that, you know, you know, the weekly board has put a video out, you know, um, you know, Meepo, Meepo Pip Pop 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 has put out a video on this thing. Does that influence your decision or do you just think, well, this is just, it's just advertising. It's just somebody else telling us how the game kind of plays and stuff like that. Does that influence your decision at all into backing, or do you just say, "Well, this is just, it's just potentially this preview's been paid for. I know they're just going to talk about the gameplay, um, 
or do you, if you know if if you see a name that you know or you like and they say well if they've done it I'll probably check out the video and it might sway your decision. Well, I I do check out the videos. Um, I I don't necessarily assume that they've been paid um, for it because some you know, but I'm sure they I'm sure they get the game right uh, as a quote unquote payment um, or even if they have to pass it on right. Um, yeah, yeah. So, so even even uh, even when it's even when it's not paid, they haven't paid money for it. There's there's something going on. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah. I, but I, I I do watch them for, um, a lot of the times it's like, well, will I like this game? What are the mechanisms like? You know that those right, videos okay. are uh, helpful. Um, you know sometimes I will I will uh, when I've watched already the the rules explanation video, which some some people have. Yeah. Um, then the other these other preview videos I'll skip right to your your thoughts. I won't I won't uh, I I won't yeah. re, uh, watch the part where they're explaining the same thing that I got from the other video. Um, so like having a, mm-hmm. a ton of explain how this game works videos is not particularly useful. <laughs> um, yeah. But getting that opinion is is I think uh, a good thing. Um, however, uh, I will say that mm-hmm. if if Rado is doing a video, Richard Ham, yeah. Um, I will watch that video um, because he either gets excited or not. And that has a very good chance of convincing me one way or the other. Um, So, you know, there's that. The other thing that I look for is a gameplay video where, um, you know, it's not the uh, creators of the game playing, you know, some other group playing. Uh, And this doesn't happen a lot, but... Um, when that does happen, yeah. I do watch that, and what I'm looking for is to see how much fun they're having. Because if they're just sitting there and uh, I'm going to move this piece here, okay, your turn. Uh-huh, I yeah. don't know. <laughs> is that kind of one thing I want? Um, so it's the experience, isn't it? I mean, this is what we're we're all kind of looking for. I mean, a game can play amazingly well in terms of its mechanics but at the end of the day if it's not a fun experience to play um, then it'll just put you off I mean what you're right I mean what is the kind of the the kind of the point the point in playing um, is there any I mean is there anything okay so in terms of like a campaign would you back a campaign where they are needing to get the art done where the 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 product isn't a hundred percent finished. Where they're saying, they they are you know the essence of Kickstarter, which is this is an idea that they have and it's a it's a really good idea, but they really need the funds in order to make it make it into something. I mean, with that, does that do you take that on a more of a case by case basis, and do you do more research into that kind of that kind of project? Well, so those kind of things, in my opinion, are more difficult to eke out um you know what what you're going to be getting um yeah. and there's also more risk uh in terms of hey this project might just fail because they um haven't thought about enough stuff up front um and they will run out of whatever money they get backing it because they don't even, if if you don't know what you're what you want to do how do you know what yeah. to you know what pledge levels to put on right so there, there's yeah. a bigger risk, but I, I will back one of those if what what they do have on there is, you know, convinces me of what I'm getting, and especially if the theme speaks to me. So in in that case, all you've got is the theme a lot of the time. Um, so, you know, if if the theme speaks to me, or and or uh, the the explanation is one that. Is thorough enough that I I I feel that they've got, you know, they've got enough of um, something behind whatever they're doing, then yes, I mm. I, I will back one of those, um, but there's very few people who do have something um, it, enough showing there that you know you don't feel like you're just giving them money to lose it. Yeah. 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 Um. Do you do you think that there's things that projects are missing out that they should be putting more of in to help kind of educate you as a potential backer? 
Is there something that you, you, you know, that a couple of projects have done and you've went, yep, this is helping me make my mind up that isn't being done by everybody, which is maybe, that could maybe help you to make that kind of decision? Honestly, it's that video of people playing who are not the creator. Right. Uh, I don't see that a lot. Um, and, and and it's it's the the one thing, the one video thing that is most likely to convince me um, to, to back. Yeah. Um, when other people who are not in a review capacity doing this, right, uh, who are just playing. Um, and uh, I, I, I don't like the super cut version of that, you know, where it's just like, hey, let's cut through the game <laughs> and give you 30, 30 yeah, seconds, yeah. you know, but I want to see the a full game played. That's why I appreciate uh, those groups that do that. Like, I think Heavy Cardboard does that. And um, yeah. the the Dice Tower guys, man. sometimes they, they do that for some of the higher profile ones who are willing to pay them yeah. <laughs> to yeah. to do the uh, the, the playthrough. Um, yeah. see, seeing them play and have fun, honestly, I, I think more people should do that. And and it it's as important to me as the how do you play this game video. Um, so, mm-hmm. and, and people uh, people who do who do video um, will. More, more likely than not, do a how to play this game video, um, and that's that's useful because it's like, do, do I like the mechanisms, um, yeah. kind of thing? Um, do I like the theme? Um, although you can get the theme from the pictures. Um, it, it's it's um, it, yeah. it, it's those, it, but it's that gameplay by other people kind of thing. I think more people should do that. I'm always interested in a video and the number of mistakes that they make. That yes, yeah, to that's me true. that's. Yeah. A- that's a big indication of how intuitive the game is to to kind of play, regardless of the um, the size of the rule book. And I'll go back to, you know, donning the purple and even, you know, say donning the purple and root. Um, you know, donning the purple, root, both similar similar sizes. In terms of um, Ravage Dungeons of Plunder as well, which I should get a special mention because, again... Um, it was very almost the game itself was very very intuitive to play. Donning the purple became very very intuitive to play very very quickly, without references to the rulebook. Root, um, root, I love you and I will take you to the beach for long walks. But wow, you really need to sort out how your playthrough for the rulebooks because there's there's so many there's too many little bits, which aren't covered in the rule books, which kind of, you know, drive drove us up the wall to the point where I shouldn't have to be referring to something online to find out if it's true. It should be set out kind of in front of me. So it's always interesting, which is why I kind of like um, Rado's stuff where he says, you know, you can spot all the mistakes that I make in, in the, when, you know, turn on the Klingon so you can see when I've kind of made a mistake, which is kind of interesting just goes to show that somebody who is still got a vast experience of kind of playing and explaining games, you know, will still make mistakes kind of thing. And I'm wondering, well, is that his fault because of his high energy and what he does? Or is that because um, it wasn't made clear enough kind of like in the, mm-hmm. in the kind of the rule books well, itself, you know? Well, uh, uh, a tangential uh, thing first on that. Uh, one thing about turning on those Klingon subtitles is that it turns on subtitles and then you got to turn them back off. <laughs> for other videos, <laughs> but uh, that aside, yeah, it, it I that is one thing where um, it it's good to have uh, even that that playthrough video of other people. They make a lot of mistakes. You have to keep going back to the book. I'll be like, hey, maybe I don't want this. Um, yeah, uh, because not necessarily that the rule book is bad, uh, which it might be. No, um, but that if there's so many exceptions to the exceptions, it's it's like I spend most of my time, you know looking through that rule book and, and delaying the game or whatever, you know. Um, so, sometimes when that kind of thing yeah. happens, um, like like the first game that I had experienced with that kind of thing was, uh, what was that? Um, uh, the Viking game the um, from Simon or Come On, whatever. Uh, oh, what I know it? the one you're talking about and its face is on the tip of my <laughs> tongue, but I know the one you're talking it was, about. So... so um, Oh, well, but whatever whatever that game was, um, the uh, it, it's a vastly popular game, um, mm-hmm. and um, there's going you realize at this moment, Henry, there are going to be people 
will be screaming. Oh, I'm sure. At, you know, in the street as they're walking down, hopefully listening to this head and headphones, it's going, it's this, you couple of morons! <laughs> Maybe like that. All right. Well, you know, okay. you, you and I are not are not as young as we used to be. <laughs> so. I'm not, you know, exactly. <laughs> you know, I, it's a, you know, it's an actual miracle that I'm not sitting here with my underwear over my trousers, to be honest, like Superman. You know, it's just one of those, one of those wonders that I remember to put them round the right way today but um you know the best thing about this situation is that none of us are frank frantically googling to find out <laughs> well what that game is and we're just gonna leave that just gonna leave that leave that kind of sitting there but no i get you i get what you mean it's like if you have the immersion is a strong part of it and if you're breaking the immersion in any way shape or form by having to go oh hang on let me just check the yep. uh, the oh no you you can't, you get four resources, not five, and it's like, well, where are we? It's like, well, you know, and you can continue on, can it as is. Right, so um, so with with that kind of thing, I'm I'm more apt to just like, okay, you know what, let's let's guess on the rule, and then while you guys are playing your turns, I'm going to look it up, and then if we can, like, you know, back it out, we will. If not, we'll just keep going and we'll play it correctly next time. Um, because it's it's yeah. just like I don't want to sit there and spend twenty minutes delaying the game, trying to find this. You know, that's the other thing about rule books. Though. So the way they're laid out, sometimes it's really infuriating. <laughs> but uh, you know, trying to find find this obscure uh, exception to that weird rule uh, is is sometimes very difficult. Um, so I, I I I don't like delaying the game. I don't like um, you know uh, I don't like being the AP one. Although I am willing to tolerate the, the AP ones at the table uh, more than maybe mm-hmm. some of the other people at the table, um, <laughs> but I, I I don't want to be the cause of the of the delay. I want people to to enjoy the experience. You know. What are your um, what are your thoughts about the the recent kind of spate, and I'm using the word spate, of cancellations by Kickstarter on certain projects. Primarily by Colossal. I mean, let's name them. I mean, you know. Um, I mean, what's your thoughts behind that? I mean, is that kind of like, is Kickstarter kind of finally kind of getting involved in its own platform? Do you think? Because there are so many companies that seem to be using Kickstarter as a as a means to cash flow in some respects. Um, well, uh well, it's it's actually there's another one that happened recently um, with the project that I backed, uh, indie indie board and cards. Uh, they had their Kodama 3D suspended as well. Yeah, um, that's because it's interesting because they're um, they're connected with um, Stronghold. Oh, Stronghold. Okay, I was trying to, I, I I made a comment. I was like, I thought they had joined with another group. Yeah, I couldn't remember the name. Yeah. Um, yeah, Str- Stronghold because, um, has something up yeah. right right now. Maybe it's the same reason. I don't know, because uh, uh, you know I, I've been reading the BGG thread, and in fact I have it. Uh, I've subscribed to it to see if there's any anything new. Um, and of course, there's there's two big camps, and and uh, and probably many other smaller camps. But there's the group that believe that it's the whole uh, unfulfilled project thing, um, and then there's a group that believes that. Uh, the whole simultaneous campaign thing, um, and and of course Kickstarter is in their rights to do whatever they want because they've, you know, they have uh, they have their rules that say, hey, uh, you can't be running a new campaign until the previous one has has fulfilled, not just you know completed, but fulfilled, um, and and so if you have too many un- unfulfilled campaigns or if you have simultaneous campaigns. Um, both of those break that same rule. You know, I it could very well be that. It could be who knows what because the, the companies are not, not talking nor do they have to, right? They're in their rights not to say anything. Um, but I wish, you know, I, I wish I knew why. Um, I, I'm not trying to say that Colossal should have said why, um, and they haven't really said why. Um, I would love to know why, but they don't, you know, the, there's no reason they should tell anybody. Um, these things, but it would it would be nice for other creators to know why, so that the other creators don't do the same thing. 
Um, so- I think if yeah, I think if this is the start of like Kickstarter deciding, well, you know, um, there, there's a possibility that a couple of things have happened. Is that um, people have got a bit of a bad taste in their mouth after what happened with a kind of like Ninja Ninja Division, mm-hmm. and all it takes is one test kind of court case to go through where somebody sues to get their money from Kickstarter to say look you know I know you know it's maybe in your terms and conditions but you run the platform you're directly benefiting off you know this platform we demand some compensation because while there's a certain amount of due diligence being done and we don't know if it's automatic or if somebody does check a project um, you know there's it's I can't I can see people using there there is going to be a case I can see in the future somebody getting Kickstarter involved in some kind of court case to say look I didn't get my money I didn't get my game I you know the company has disappeared with the money you've taken ten percent I demand that I at least get kind of like X amount back you know kind of thing. Which is interesting. I am really, really surprised that Travis has decided, for whatever reason, not to make people aware of the reason why Colossal were suspended and let back on, even if it was into kind of like an inner circle kind of thing, because the creators kind of talk to each other. And I'm kind of surprised that they haven't kind of made people aware or made their customers aware of it, because again, I don't know if I was a backer of that campaign, if I was told. I mean, Papillion, I think, is one of them that's kind of... I think it was it was funded and then finished and then Kickstarter suspended and actually cancelled it and now it's coming back on. But I'd like to know exactly, well, what is, what is the situation as a potential backer? Am I going to end up, you know, am I going to end up kind of committing money and this is the R side of it I mean as you, you know you said yourself that you have a monthly budget um you know you have a you have a you have a budget that you put aside for Kickstarter if you had committed to say Papillion if you'd committed to you know and and then at the end of it you know that that, that you're saying well I can't back anything else because that money's tied up now it kind of you know it's kind of pushing the thing where you're not able to maybe back another project it's interesting we shall see if this is going to be the start if we're going to i reckon we're going to see more i don't know if you think there might be kind of more campaigns suffering the same fate yeah uh, i i well, it i it certainly seems like they're doing that more uh especially with this the the ibc thing um but sure they're they're, they're in their rights to do that and these companies have no they have no uh no, no need to tell everybody wh- why. Uh, unfortunately, yeah, as much as we would, we would yeah. both love to know. Um, yeah. Who knows? They might have even signed an NDA or something like that. Oh, you you yeah, can't tell. Exactly. So, you know, maybe the who knows? Yeah. And 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 so fine. The, so be it. That's business. Uh, I think we just have to roll with it. Uh, in, in terms of the whole budget thing, yeah, sure. Uh, if I've committed my money to, to Papillon and. Um, they haven't, uh, you know, and, and they canceled it after the, it completed, and which is frankly mm-hmm. what did happen. I, I did back that <laughs> after seeing you back that. <laughs> okay. um, you yeah. know, uh, so uh, that did happen, and um, so fine. But the thing is, in the, in the, at in the end, right? These are just games. These are luxury items, you know. And yeah, and are. as long as you're not spending your, you know, food money. On this, you know, either you can say, "Well, I, I, I just saved sixty bucks for June or whatever," um, mm-hmm. or mm-hmm. you can then immediately say, "Okay, well, now I have sixty bucks that I didn't spend last month. <laughs> I can spend this month." Yeah. Uh, so you know, it, exactly. It, 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 it you know, as long as okay. long as you're not spending your your necessity money on this luxury stuff, you know, it's just I can pay it forward. Yeah. You know. <laughs> <laughs> to the next month, so so, I, so yeah. I, I don't think in in terms of sure it 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 makes you mad, especially uh, if you were really into it, like you know I really rapidly want this papillon, um, uh, <laughs> you know like reading some of those comments, <laughs> you get, you get, sometimes you get that feeling. But you know the, the thing about uh, about about comments though um, is that 
people have to realize that behind the behind this wall of the internet, there's a person. And you yeah. know, you, you you can't <laughs> you can't go around insulting everybody, um, you know, just because it makes you feel better. There's 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 people there, and and if if you're insulting them, they're being insulted, and you know, it they're you know, this is a world of people. You got you got to get along. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Um, would you ever design something? Um, well, I have made kitty board games when I was a kid. You know, like a right, okay. I, I had the I had yeah. this roll and move Night Rider game, some dumb stuff. Wow! Uh, <laughs> no way! Hell yeah! Uh, wow! I, I probably have it in some notebook somewhere, but but no, I I have uh, wow! <laughs> I I am I am not <laughs> uh I, I am not a designer. No, I it. You know, just 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 playing these games, and and just even reading the rule books, it's like I would never be able to do that. I don't have that kind of brain. Um, I'm sure other people do, but uh, not me. Uh, I, I'm I'm not, I'm not that kind of. Maybe maybe if, if I retire and I have like tons of free time and I can develop it, sure. <laughs> <laughs> but, but that's not going to happen for a few years. <laughs> so no. <laughs> Excellent. Um, one last question. Okay. Sure. Um, you are are being involved in the zombie apocalypse. You're running down the street like just like just like a madman trying to escape from the zombie horde. You stumble into a into a games emporium that has every single type of game that's ever existed. Um, in the middle of the floor, there is a cracking, pneumatically wheeled red trolley that has the ability to carry board games. Now, you can have three board games. They can be any games at all. First edition, second editions, any expansions that you want. Um, on your journey... You need to know, be aware of two things. You're going to meet all different types of people on your journey. And the answer to the question about what games you take with you is always going to, <clears throat> is always going to be a yes to would you like to play a game. So what three games do you take with you, Henry, on your ongoing journey? Okay, so I would absolutely want a game that I can solo. And at this point, Seventh Continent. Uh, and then I would probably want a game to bring a, a go board and all of its stones, um, like a one of those heavy Japanese that you can sit on the floor kind of boards, um, because I could one use that as a weapon, and um, two if you know if I'm in the zombie apocalypse, I have a lot of time to figure out all the how to play that game properly, and then <laughs> um, the third one would probably be something like five minute dungeon uh, which is like this crazy frenetic thing where you can just like quickly play with anybody kind of thing yeah cool cool excellent um thank you very very much for coming on well thank you for having me i i hope this is not the most boring podcast for everybody (laughs) oh not at all it's as i say we hear a lot from creators and designers and developers and we very rarely hear from people who are kind of involved in backing campaigns and kind of putting them you know putting your money into people's pockets to help them with their with their tabletop dreams for a lot of these people so um, i'm sure a lot of the creators that listen to this show are going to be fascinated by what you have to say in terms of what you are looking for when you see a you know when you see a campaign on kickstarter um, but you've got nothing to sell. <laughs> you've got nothing to yep. sell. You've got nothing to offer. Um, if people want to see you on the internet webs, I I have a Twitter account. That's the only social media account I have, actually. Oh, okay, okay. What's that? What's that? Uh, it's Inxi. I N X I. There you go. Well, I can put that in the show notes <laughs> so we've got notes to show. But that's pretty much it. Okay. Cool. 
Um, if you want to keep an eye on what we're up to, it's quite simple. Go to the internet, search for We're Not Wizards. You shall find us. There you go. Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, um, all the podcast catchers that have got the word cast and the word pod in them. Um, even Spotify, which has got neither, but still has us there. You can find us on places like YouTube. You can email us, magic at wearenotwizards.com. You can go to our website, wearenotwizards.com, or blog, wearenotwizards.blogspot.com. Um, if you like what you've listened to tonight, and you should, and all you creators should be paying attention to what Henry had to say, because he's dropping knowledge and gold, basically. But if you like what you've listened to, tell somebody else. Because it's always nice to have somebody else come in and start enjoying the show and um, another thing you can do is go to the Apple podcast and you can drop us a rating, a review or a subscription, if you drop us a subscription we love you forever, if you drop us a rating or review, don't give us 10 stars because it makes us big headed but don't give us 1 star because it makes us cry give us something in the middle like a 5 because it's average and we're just a little bit average but the person who's not been average Rather wonderful, rather fantastic, Mr. Henry So. Not a wizard. Thank you again. So not a wizard. Exactly. It's official. It's on Kickstarter. You can find them. It's on there. Um, Thank you again. Um, There's only two more things to do. The first thing is to remember, he's got it in his name. There's no point in asking the question. You know, remember, we're many things, but we're not wizards. Are we wizards, Henry? No, but there's the temptation. Don't even go there. It's been a lovely time. Don't <laughs> spoil it at the end. And the second thing is to say goodbye. So it's goodbye from Henry. Say goodbye. Henry. Goodbye. And it's a goodbye from me. Remember, stay safe. Roll sixes. Make something awful. And, um, yeah, listen to this. Listen to what Henry has to say. He's got some good information for you thinking about starting your Kickstarter campaign in the near future. But until the next time, goodbye. A wizard is never late. Is he early? He arrives precisely when he means to. Mm-hmm.